Hi everybody, I'm Margie Meacham and welcome to Mapping Neuroscience to Application. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and I think I'm going to get off of this stage so we can be a little more friendly. So I got interested in learning when I was seven years old because I had trouble learning how to read. I really was struggling and in fact the good sisters of St. Agnes wanted to hold me back. And I can clearly remember sitting outside of the principal's office and hearing my father say in a little bit of an angry voice, my daughter is not stupid. It's your job to figure out what's wrong and help her learn. Well, my father had six children at this private school. He was paying pretty big tuition and they weren't about to lose six students. So they said, okay, if she comes back in second grade and she can read, then that's fine. So all summer, my family worked with me. They took turns and really just through repetition, I was fine, I was ready by the time September rolled around. And in fact, by the time I got to high school, I was valedictorian. And what I discovered in college is that I had undiagnosed dyslexia, which was why it was so difficult to learn to read, and math has never been my strong suit. But once I understood what was going on, it made such a difference, and I was so fascinated that my brain was working like that that I decided to become a teacher. So I got my degree in teaching, but I discovered that teachers at that time weren't really making a lot of money and I kind of needed money. <laughs> so instead, I went into sales. And if anybody has ever been in sales, the very best ones are also extraordinary teachers. That's how they make their sales. So I did that for a few years and I was invited to become a sales trainer and that's how I got back into education for adults. Now how many people have been told that adult learners are this way? Young learners are this way. That's just one of the myths that we're going to get rid of today. A brain is a brain is a brain. And you know, some of us knew that all along, right? Instinctively, I never bought into that. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about neuroscience and what we've learned about our brains and how that applies to what we do so we can help people learn better. I call it brain-aware design. So first, a couple of housekeeping things. Hey, it worked. I was I kind of, the first time, you know, you do it, you're always like, will it work over here? These are not quite the same slides that are available on our conference site because I tinkered with them. So the most current version is there on learningtogo.info. It's free, and I'm going to talk about some tools that are part of this session, and they're downloads, and they're also free. So I've got some templates and things for you. So make a note of that. We're also going to, it's a little bit of a learning demonstration. So let's make sure everybody knows the website so you're not asking me later where can you get your materials. Where is it? Dot info, okay. I'm on Twitter, I tweet almost every day about the brain. And of course, speaking of Twitter, we want you to use our hashtag, LSCON for Learning Solutions Conference. And we want you to use the app to give us feedback at the end of the session. These are the learning objectives for this session, and that might seem like a lot, but most of them are going to be satisfied with one of these templates. So I'm just going to tell you what the tool does for you and remind you where you can get it. So we're going to start with describing the recent discoveries about learning in the brain. Before we do, though, let's test your knowledge. I mean, we're all in the learning profession, right? So you probably already know a lot. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to read the question, since you may not be able to see it in the back. Just raise your hand if you believe it's true. First one, brains work like supercomputers. OK? Listening to Mozart can make you smarter. Most people use only 10% of their brains. Ooh, that was a quick one. The more wrinkles you have in your brain, the smarter you are. You can learn while you sleep by playing an audiobook. Man has the largest brain of any animal. Interesting. 
Intelligence is an inherited trait. Ah, okay. Left brain people are analytical and right brain people are creative. And if you're not sure, left brain people are right handed and right brain people are left handed. Learners are divided equally between visual, kinesthetic, and auditory learners. All right, let's see how we did. <laughs> Absolutely every one of them is false. So I'm gonna run down them quickly, let's take a look. The brain doesn't work like a supercomputer, even though we often see that analogy used. It works more like the internet. It is so complex and has so many cross connections that it's a much better image if you think of the internet, a network of networks, than a simple computer. Now, some of you might remember Jeopardy a couple of years ago. Big Blue fairly successfully played Jeopardy. That's what was all it was programmed for. It couldn't have a conversation with Alex Trebek or anybody else. It couldn't have feelings or emotions didn't remember its first birthday. So it's not like a supercomputer. Think of it like the internet. Listening to Mozart can make you smarter. There was one study with college students where they thought they had proved this, but no one's been able to replicate it. And that's the way science is proved. So somebody comes out with a discovery, they publish it, everybody else goes out and tries to repeat it. So it has never been proven beyond that one study. So something, something different happened there. The more, um, most people use only 10% of their brains. Now that we can actually watch a brain while it works, we use all of it all the time. Our brains always, and the way it looks, I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute, it looks like a light show going on in your brain because the neurons transfer electrochemical energy from one to the other, and little sparks are going all the time. We don't know what all those parts of the brain do. We only know what 10% of it does, but that doesn't mean you're not using it. It just means we've got some more work to do. Uh, the wrinkles in your brain. Here's where that comes from. It's a bit of a misconception. Compared to any other animal, our cerebral cortex, the front of your brain, has more folds, if you want to call them wrinkles, in it. What that does is give us more surface space. So we have more room to store neurons and to you know, have cognition. But that doesn't mean the brain itself is the largest. Larger animals, like whales and elephants, have larger brains. But in relation to our body size, our brain is the largest. So one thing that's happening a lot with neuroscience is oversimplifications, which leads to these false impressions. Because it took me a lot longer to say that than to say man has the largest brain. So that's one thing we're going to talk about, being careful of that. Intelligence is an inherited trait. This was actually believed to be true by scientists and doctors and teachers until about 10 years ago. And then we found out you can actually change your intelligence score by conscious decision to work on your brain. It changes over time. Hopefully, it's always improving, but if you don't nurture your brain, it can also go down. So it's not an inherited trait, so at least not entirely. It's a choice. Left brain people are analytical, right brain people are creative. Another one we thought was true until we could see the brain. And the truth is, everybody's using their left and their right brain, and so there's absolutely no scientific proof that that is true. And the last one, learners, I think it's the last one, yes. Um, you guys were, were right on top of that one. The vast majority of people prefer visual learning. That's because that was our first language. Before we could write, or represent numbers, we could draw pictures. And so the brain is very comfortable with that. But be very careful categorizing people as this type of learner or that type of learner, because the truth is, the more of those modalities you get going at once, the better everybody learns. So yes, we're visual learners. We're also auditory learners. 
and we're kinesthetic learners, which is why we should always be figuring out how to get our learners to move their bodies when they're taking e-learning. It's a very difficult thing to do, but at least you can, for example, give them a notebook and tell them to take notes. The act of taking notes excites different neurons and gives you a second pathway, another filing system for your, what you're learning. So we're going to talk about some of those things. So anyway, you guys did very well on that quiz. And our first objective is by the time I'm finished with this session, you should be able to discuss three new discoveries we've had about our brains in the first 10 years. I'm going to give you several. You pick the ones you like the best. The reason we know all this is because we can watch the brain in actual operation. It is amazing. You can go out and Google it, and you can see some videos of the lights going on. So I have static images, and I think even they are way cool. This is a brain that um, is in a high degree of activity. And the way they measure it in this functional MRI, fMRI, is by blood flow. Because as the brain needs energy, more blood comes to that part. So you see the, the orange and red are the areas of highest activity. And the blue is lower, but it's still active. So here's some of the things we've learned from those brain imaging tools. One thing we've learned that blew them away about 10 years ago is that the brain is plastic. And here's what that means. It means it's always changing. It's always rewiring itself. Prior to this discovery, they really thought that by the time you hit 21, your brain was pretty well fixed. You'd learned what you were going to learn. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Actually, you can. And as a matter of fact, older dogs are often better learners and older people because they have more experience. And your brain is always drawing on what it already knows and adding that to the new information. Another very important thing to understand, and you'll hear this a lot, the brain is built for our survival. The reason we have this whole package is because it helped us survive. And so some of the things that our brain does to help us survive have to be taken into account when you're designing a course. One of these is attention. Now, we were built, and um, I'm a big fan of Dilbert, so I like this, uh, this one about attention. If you can imagine that you are in a jungle, and there are predators all around you, and you're going to need dinner tonight, and eventually you need to find a mate so you can pass on your genes, movement is something you really need to pay attention to. Because if there's something rustling in the bushes, it could be one of those three things, right? Could be food, or it could be someone who sees me as dinner, or maybe it's a very attractive fellow human and they're my future mate. So we pay attention to movement. That's one reason why video is so, so effective. There's other reasons why it's effective, and we'll get to that too. Similarities. We look for patterns. Our brains are very good at finding patterns. Some animals are actually better at it, but we're pretty darn good at it. So forcing people to find the pattern for themselves rather than telling them is going to make for a stronger design. We, look, we also see when things are different. And we respond to rewards. Our brain actually gives us a chemical to make us feel good when we learn something. And finally, we respond to strong emotion. Now, how many of you are in corporate training? In corporate training, most of us, in corporate training, we very often are trying to eliminate emotion. It's not considered appropriate, right? But it happens anyway. All learning has an emotional component. We're either bored, or we're having fun, or we're curious, or we're angry that we have to take this silly course, or so if it's happening anyway, and that's part of how the brain encodes the information so you can retrieve it later, is by how you were feeling when you learned it, then let's be intentional about it and drive them towards an emotion that we want. Now, 
gosh, see, my titles are kind of drifting off the top. I apologize for that. Working memory, short-term memory, works one way. And permanent, longer-term memory, it's not really permanent because of that plasticity, works another way. So you've probably seen this in your own, here's what happens to me all the time. Honey, I'm going shopping. Do we need anything? Yes, we need milk and we need eggs. I get to the door and he says, oh yeah, and we need bread and sugar. Now what am I doing? I'm walking back and I'm making a list because he just went past what I could hold in my brain. Happens all the time, right? Phone number, same thing. And you might remember the phone number long enough to dial it, but if somebody asks you later what number did you dial, you're probably gonna have to look it up on your phone. That's because your brain has already discarded it as irrelevant. It's constantly, remember it's there to help you survive. So if it doesn't look like it's survival level information, it may not be kept. So in this case, this young fellow sees a very attractive lady. He learns her name, Jane. She's in his chemistry class. And mm, she smells nice. By the way, I could have picked a hot guy. Works the same way. So he's got that information in his short-term memory. He can keep a few little things in there about Jane. Now when he sleeps, this is why sleep is so important for the brain, the brain does two important things in terms of moving from short to long-term memory. It detoxifies itself, so it's cleaning out the toxins that happen during the day so it stays healthy, and it's cross-referencing what happened during the day. And if you've had a crazy day, you sometimes will dream about it, or you'll wake up and you go, wow, it, something was going on. I really felt strange during the night. Well, that was all of that sequencing and cross-referencing. And in that case, some of it gets discarded. So in this case, he didn't remember much about chemistry class that day. That just wasn't high on the priorities. But Jane, he's got that down. Now, if he never goes out with Jane, eventually that information's gonna fade. Here is how information is transmitted. It's transmitted from cell to cell, and they don't touch. The neurons don't touch. There's a little gap. It's called the synapse. And that is where they send a spark, electrochemical charge, from one to the other. And they start to develop a chain of the neurons to make the information. So it's a pathway. And when we learn something, we get rewarded. We get a rush of endorphins. Anybody familiar with runner's high? That those are endorphins, kicks in, makes you feel good. Well, we evolved to reward ourselves for being active because that tended to keep you alive. The same thing with learning. Learning is actually experiencing, when a person's learning, they're experiencing the same chemical rush that happens when you have sex, eat chocolate, um, use a, a, a yeah, mind-affecting drug, because we want learning to be addictive. And in our species, it is. We're addicted to it. We need it. And that's why people get very unhappy in boring jobs, among other things. So over time, you've created this pathway of neurons. And I make it sound like it's simple. Even the simplest thing you learned is a very complex interconnection web of your, of your neurons. Every time you need that information, you go back over it. So we've had a lot of people walk into the beach, and what have they done? They've worn a path. And what would happen if we close that beach off? Oh, I'm connected to Wi-Fi, good for me. Um, <laughs> if we closed it off, what's gonna happen? The grass is gonna grow over it, it's gonna fade, and we might lose that path entirely. That's why, if you've ever crammed for a test, and you do pretty well with it, but two days later, you can't remember anything. And we have that sometimes in our workplace training because we never go back and reinforce it and force them to use it. Now you not only need to force them to use it, but there's something called the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. The spacing of learning is very important. At first, we want to revisit that learning frequently and in very short intervals. 
So in the same course, you might have to repeat the same key concept several times until they've really got it. Then what should happen is they go home, they sleep, they come back, they have to do it again. Now after that, now maybe we repeat it again in a week, in a month, in three months. So every course should be built with refreshers, to, if, if it matters. If people need to know it, if we should do it at all, we have to do it with repetition. The other thing that I find just so interesting is most of us think of our brain as in our skull, right? But that skull is connected to the spinal cord, is connected to the nervous system, is connected to every little nerve in your body. The brain is distributed throughout the body, if you want to think about it that way. That's why what's going on in your body is so important to what's going on in your learning. And so those of us who manage classroom training know that, that if it's too hot, it's too cold, it's before lunch. Today, a lot of folks are thinking about getting home. They're tired. Maybe they had a lot of fun with Mickey Mouse last night. So that's going to affect how much information you can take in. So it's very important to keep your learners refreshed and healthy. And if you can add some of the senses in, and I'm not sure how we do this with e-learning, like smell-o-vision or something, but if you can, that's going to make it stronger. Another thing that we need to understand is success versus failure. We learn from our successes, but we learn a lot more from our failures. And sometimes we make it too easy for the learners to pass, to pass an assessment or to succeed in a little activity. It should be challenging. They should learn from it. They should say, wow, I don't know this yet. And that motivates them. And they will learn more from that than from everything being really easy and smooth. Now, I mentioned earlier the power of video. And one of the reasons why it is so powerful has to do with something called mirror neurons. Now, this has been oversimplified, this particular concept, quite a bit. And if you go out and look, you'll see people saying, be careful how you use it. So I recognize I'm kind of giving you a very simplified piece of information. So keep that in mind. But here's what happens. We watch each other. We are very observant. You know that attention, survival attention we have? Well, before we had language, this was how we taught each other to use tools or to find food or to express emotion. So we are very good. Our brain lights up when we watch someone else. Now, this is March Madness time. I don't know how many of you have a good bracket going on. Mine is kind of, uh, kind of done. A couple upsets did me in. But subject A is actually doing a task. Subject B is watching subject A or maybe watching a simulation on a screen. But if you're going to do a simulation, if you can get a human hand in there, now they know that is a human, a fellow human, and the brain will react more than just a mouse moving around. But notice another thing. There's actually more activity in brain B. So here's why I mentioned March Madness. There was a study done of basketball players practicing free throws. Anybody familiar with this one? They put them in two groups, and one group practiced every day, and they got coaching. They got feedback on every throw so they could improve their form. The other group just sat and watched group A. Both groups improved, and group B improved more because every time in their head they were throwing, the perfect free throw, whereas the people practicing were, in some cases, repeating mistakes. So if you can get people to observe a perfect model, they're going to be successful in learning it. Now, that doesn't mean you never get hands-on training, but it does give us hope that you can learn by watching someone else. It's another modality you can use. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is an actual picture of the electrical signals going on in the brain. 
at the, um, down at the actual mo molecular level, not even the cellular level. So what I'd like you to do is just take a minute and think about, now that you know some of this, is that going to change the way you do your work? Or is it going to change the way you talk to your children or approach your life? And just as you're thinking, just kind of let the, the, those uh, cells fire. And picture, if you have a difficult task, if you start it by revving up your brain, by picturing the, ne the neurons flying around, sending those messages, you will actually find you're more productive. Because you can give your brain important information. So now we have a problem. All that cool stuff, right? I hope you found at least three things you found really interesting. Here's the problem. Now that the general public is aware to some extent, you're seeing a lot of articles on neuroscience. You've probably read some. Or the neuroscience of this. You know, the neuroscience of flower arrangement. You know, it's probably out there. And it might be perfectly fine, but it might be highly oversimplified or exaggerated or misunderstood and misstated or somebody's out to make a buck and they know that neuroscience is hot right now so let's tag that onto our program so you have to be very careful so one of the things I'm giving you is a hypometer it's like a thermometer for hype and there it is and this is what it'll look like when you download it. It's just a little form, and these are the questions that are on it. So ask yourself, where's this information coming from? Anything that someone says about the brain right now, if they don't say something like, here's what it looks like, here's what we think, here's where the information's heading. If they say, hey, it's this and we know it for sure, question that. Because we don't know much at all about the brain. We're still exploring it. And I guarantee you, in the next 10 years, several of the things I just told you will be found out to be false. Because we're still studying. These are what the latest studies are telling us. So that's what you should be hearing from people who are telling you this and that about the brain. Look at their expertise. Find out who funded the research. Did they have some kind of agenda? Now, that's not to say you can't make money. I make money working with the brain, so I hope I'm doing it ethically. I'm just saying, keep that in mind. And, you know, one or two of those things can keep you in the safe range. If everything starts moving over here, start to be concerned. So, let's say you go home and you say, wow, oh, yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry, I did go a little bit quickly over that. I don't mean English, French, Spanish. I mean, is it over-the-top exaggeration language? You know, um, make everybody love you by doing these three simple brain tricks, that kind of stuff. Um, probably over-exaggerated. And if I said always over-exaggerated, I'd be guilty of the same thing. So <laughs> probably over-exaggerated. So now you go home and you say, gosh, I want to design differently. I want to develop differently. I want to look at our program and see if we couldn't tweak it a little bit. You might need to make a business case to do that because there's probably going to be some labor involved. And even, even if you just start fresh and say, my next course is going to be this way, you're going to build in more repetition, for example. A stakeholder might look at that and say, why are we going over this again? And until you have some results, it might be a little bit of a hard sell. So, yes? I just wanted to comment. There's also um, the uh, Debunkers Club that has created now that you kind of put to bed some of these myths. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Which is not scientifically based. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you're buying, the speaker before me had to do a business case to buy a new LMS. I happen to have written the questions and the slides to apply to a brain aware design, but really you could use it for anything. And basically you have to figure out what do we need to do differently, how are we going to do it, what results do we expect. So if you're measuring learning in some way, you're measuring your results, you should be able to see them go up. If they don't, then maybe, you know, maybe everything I'm saying is uh, not as valuable as I think. And the last question is the one I love the most and so many people forget. What's the risk of not doing it? If we keep doing the same old thing, we're going to get the same results, right? So if you want improvement, something has to change. So if you're looking at your program and you're trying to figure out, is my program brain aware? There are certain things I look at when I sit down with someone and say, let's see how your current program is. And what I'm looking for are specific things. How do they get attention? Are they appealing to emotions? Can I tell they've built that in? How much repetition is there? And when I say repetition, going back over the same information does not mean you just copy the same slide you know, and show it. You revisit the information in different ways. How spaced is the learning? Having house curve, do they? get refresher training, or are they supposed to learn it all in one session and then that's it? There you go, you're fixed. That does not work. How are we helping them store that information in the brain? So the brain is cross-referencing any new information. It's doing it right now with you. It's cross-referencing new information with what you already know. So do we help them do that? Do we point out? Here's what you already know. Here's what you thought you knew that's not quite true. So I did that at the beginning very deliberately because now you have tapped into what you know about the brain and you can start adding new information to it, building on that chain of neurons. Another thing that helps a lot is a cue or a trigger and to be very explicit about it. So you might say, so the next time you talk to a customer, you're going to do this. So you're showing them how the learning is used. And again, this doesn't have to be condescending or overly repetitive. You use your skills to get that information across. By giving them cues, you're telling them it's significant. I mean, everybody's job is pretty significant, right? That gets that survival um, cue going for them. So I look for those kind of things, and I've given you a little evaluation for it for that. Now we've decided there's a couple programs we might want to make more brain friendly. So how do we do that? Well, one thing you could do is look at it and see. Do we the exactly the same thing I just said? How's the spacing? How's the repetition? How is the emotional period? We have it there. And there's some very specific things you could do. And I could actually do a whole session on each of these, so I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. And I'm happy to talk to you later, or you can reach me by email. Graphic organizers. Now that's a fancy word for a table, or a chart, or a picture, but the idea is that an, an inf infographic is also a graphic organizer. You know, they're pretty hot now. But what makes it useful for the brain is if it's not completely filled in and they have to fill in the rest. And you can do this in e-learning, or you can give them a workbook and have them write it out, but don't give it all to them. Make them complete it for themselves. How many is, people are in uh, K, K through 12? Anybody here from that group? You're gonna find that K through 12 is already much more attuned to brain design. So if you wanna get good at this, make friends with the teacher. They're already doing a lot of it. Role-playing observation. Why does that work? What did I talk about earlier? S certain kind of neuron? Mirror neurons, that's right. So get that into it. And again, you can do that with video if you're doing an e-learning course. It doesn't have to be classroom. Now, I said music won't make you smarter, but it can help you learn if it's the right music for the task at hand because your brain starts to synchronize with that beat. 
So if you're looking for creativity, the thinking is maybe jazz should be playing. And if it's mathematical, maybe it should be a very rhythmic type of music. And if it's reflective, something soft and that tranquil. So there are some things that you might want to think about with music. Video, for, the, for those mirror neurons, is a very good thing to have. And because we're so observant, we're so attuned to motion, the video can really be a powerful tool, as we're all finding. The next one might surprise you. How many people learned multiplication with flashcards? How many people don't remember what that is or don't know? A lot of young people probably didn't learn with flashcards, but they're very effective. On one side is a term you know, and on the other side is the term you're supposed to link it to. And that's literally what your brain is doing. Alerts. An alert is like suddenly there's something in the bush and I need to pay attention to it. So a little pop-up comes up and says, hey, this is really important. Now use them sparingly because if you do it too much, fatigue sets in. If everything is important, suddenly nothing's important. And that's what the brain will conclude. So you can only use it a couple of times, maybe. We're also natural explorers. We are hardwired to explore. We're naturally curious. So something as simple as a scavenger hunt or just open up the application and let them figure out. So instead of saying, just to place a new order, click the new button. You ask them, here's the home screen. What would you do to place a new order? Let them explore it. Let them figure it out. Also, less work on your part. The next one, learning to learn. When people understand what the brain is doing, they learn better. So go ahead and tell them. So you're about to take this course. We're going to ask you to fill in some forms. That's because that's going to help you retrieve the information later. We're going to ask you to take notes. We're going to play some games. Those games have purpose. Let them know that you have planned it so they can learn. And finally, emotional connection. Try to grab them emotionally right away. It can be a positive emotion, like imagining their future success now that they have learned a new skill, or your life is going to be so easy now because this new application is going to be great as soon as you learn how to use it. Or it could be, it's OK to generate a little fear. You know, a salesman is worried he's not going to make his quota, but we have some tools that will help you. All of those get their attention. Get it right up front. Keep getting it. So this form that you're going to download from where? Learning to go.info. That lists all those things. And by the way, they're not PDFs. They're Word or PowerPoint, so you can edit them yourself. I hate that. When somebody gives me something really cool, and I really can't use it because I want to customize it a little bit. And you do that for every course. So now we have one more learning objective. And then I have a little gift for you, because I'm very appreciative that you came here on a Friday after soaking in all this great news. So, and I'm really thrilled to see so many people, so I have a prize for you. But first, we have to talk about evaluating learning. Now that we know how the neuroscientists evaluate, determine if learning's taking place, we could do a similar thing. Before we could see the brain, we would take a level one survey, or give them a test, or ask them, did you learn anything? And we'd look at the numbers, oh, yeah, that was a successful course. But since we now can observe people learning, why not put a little bit of that into your evaluation? So ask them and watch them. Did their behavior change? Ask their supervisor, did the behavior change? By the way, that's nothing new. That's Kirkpatrick, right? Uh, the late, great gentleman, all that stuff still applies. But let's add, what questions do they ask? If they don't come away from your training with questions, they don't come away with more questions so they want to explore, you probably didn't engage them. So part of your survey might be, what, are the, what else do you want to know? What do learners, where do they go for more information? That exploration, ask them, where would you go for more information? 
if they can't think of anything, they're probably not very engaged. What did they find most significant? A lot of times we're surprised by that answer. It's not the main thing we were trying to teach them. It might be some little simple thing. Well, if that's the most significant, we need to know it for next time. How does the new content relate to previous learning? You could do this by asking them, how does this relate to your job or to what you already knew? And in fact, I'm gonna ask you guys that in a little bit. And this one is the old, the old exam, although you can also do it in behavior. How quickly can they retrieve that information? Did they really get it into their permanent memory? And if you are testing them the same day they took the course, you can't measure that because what you're measuring is short-term memory. You have to wait, let them process, and then go back. And it could be as soon as the next day. But you are not measuring long-term memory if you do it right after the class. All right, so now we've gone over our objectives. And I'd like you guys to think about one thing you might do differently. And maybe you can turn to your neighbor and if you have enough energy by the end of the conference to do that and share that, and while you're doing that, I'm going to be giving out your gift. 